Okay, guys, this could be one of the most important conversations that you stumbled upon in a while. We are looking at the election season. Yes, it's not just a day anymore. It's a season. And we have to make hard decisions uh, this November. Is it really that hard? I don't know. Is it? I don't think it's that hard when we look at biblical uh, principles and values. So we're going to discuss that with Tim Gagline, who's one of our board members at Family Policy Alliance and Christians Engaged, uh, but has been with Focus on the Family as the Vice President of External and Government Relations for years, uh, like two decades. Before that, he worked for the Bush administration uh, with Faith Engagement uh, he worked on the Senate side as a press secretary. He worked uh, in lots of different political positions. Uh, I think very few people have a perspective like Tim. You're going to be really, really blessed as we talk about the general election. You stick around right now. Welcome to the Conversations with Christians Engaged podcast. I'm your host, Bunny Pounds, the president of Christians Engaged. This ministry exists to awaken, motivate, educate, and empower ordinary believers in Jesus Christ to do three things. To pray for our elected officials and our nation regularly. To vote in every election to impact our culture and to engage in some form of civic education or involvement for the well-being of our nation. So thankful, Bunny, for what you do. A lot of people talk the talk, but you really walk the walk. There's nobody else I want to talk to about Jesus with than you. And I will stand and lock arms with this woman of God, Bunny Pounds, any day of the week. Uh, Bunny, you are a, a new hero of mine. And I'm 100% behind something that Bunny Pounds is doing. Encourage her, pray for her, and be involved. Be part of Christians actively engaged. America is worth it. Now is the time. America needs your involvement. Please take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. Join with a movement of other Christians that are doing these three simple things that can really impact this nation. Join us. All right, guys, we're here with Tim Gagline. I'm so excited. Not only is he one of my new bosses being on our board of directors of Family Policy Alliance, um, but he's also the government relations person for Focus on the Family. So, Tim, it is so great to have you with us today. It's great to be with you, Bunny, and thanks for the invitation. Well, we're going to get into this conversation about the general election and the apathy within Christians and voting patterns and how we need to be thinking related to the general election as it relates to our Christian values. But, um, you know, this has been a big news that we merged with Family Policy Alliance in July and our ministry has just exploded. Uh, We are over 20 Plus, now family policy councils that are using Christians engaged in each state. And we're just continuing to go towards growing to a million Christians uh, to activate the vote. So you were one of the board members that thought this was a good idea for Christians engaged to become part of the FPA family. Uh, I want to hear your perspective on why you thought that was a good idea. You know, I learned from a great mentor of mine, uh, Bunny, that uh, if you want to be effective in public policy, uh, that there is an anchor view. And the anchor view is that it must always be about addition and multiplication and never about subtraction and division. Now, that seems so elemental. I I remember uh, Churchill famously after Dunkirk, uh, where there was so much rightful, uh, you know, celebratory uh, you know, dancing in the streets. My my heavens, you know, they had been saved off of Dunkirk. And Churchill, in very Churchillian fashion, with that courage of a lion, said, just remember, wars are never won by evacuation. Uh, and I, I absolutely love that. So the, the view is you have to grow the coalition. You have to actively search out people who are just as passionate about, uh, you know, the issues that you care about, family, marriage, parenting, human life, uh, religious liberty, parental rights, conscience rights, uh, you know, the, the, the national debate we're having over pronouns, this, uh, this incredible uh, debate about what is a man, uh, you know, what, what is a woman, uh, what is a child, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me uh, that when a group like Family Policy Alliance can look at a group like Christians Engaged 
and say, uh, you know, they are simpatico with us, uh, and their worldview is the same, rooted in Jesus Christ, uh, then you say, how can we build from here? And it was for that reason and those principal reasons as a board member that I was very enthusiastic about uh, this new marriage. Well, it has been incredible. And the FPA team has just been so, I mean, I cannot even tell you how um, incredible it's been to be a part of this family. So we we feel very loved. Um, so I want to talk just as we b- begin, Tim, give us some background. Everybody in Capitol Hill knows who you are. You worked in the Bush administration Um, working with the faith community. You've done so much and you've written so many books. We're going to talk about your new book uh, as well, but give us a little bit of your background and then we'll go into uh, what I think is a very important conversation. And one you talk to our young people about, about how we engage with the general election. Great. Well, I can do the bio part very fast, born and raised in what I call the center of the universe, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, where much of my extended family remains. Uh, I was an intern for U.S. Senator Dan Quayle, who at the time was the youngest U.S. Senator uh, in that esteemed body. Uh, then I was an intern for Dan Coates, another obscure Dan from uh, the House of Representatives in Indiana. Providence cleared his throat a year after I graduated uh, from college, and Dan Quayle became the Vice President of the United States of America. Dan Coates became the new U.S. Senator. I became the new Deputy Press Secretary for the new U.S. Senator. I ended up staying uh, about 10 years, which in dog years is 5 million years in the U.S. Senate, Uh, and then to the White House with George W. Bush as a special assistant to the president. I was there, Bunny, for nearly eight years. So if you add all that together, it's almost 18 years working for Julius Caesar, all in the swamp. Uh, but always as a very committed Christian uh, and conservative in that order. Uh, married, two sons, and, uh, you know, we, we, we view the, uh, the public policy and cultural tsunami of the time that we're in as a fundamental part of our vocation. And by God's grace, we're in Washington, D.C., and pleased to be here of nearly four decades. Well, and it's great because Family Policy Alliance was started out of focus on the family, uh, Dr. Yes. Dobson started both uh, organizations. It was started as Focus on the Family Action, then split off in, into its own organization. But um, just I love that we're like sister brother organizations and your expertise there in D.C. with Focus on the Family is just crucial. So let's start at the beginning because I know we're in October now and we're thinking only about the presidential election. But I want to start because a lot of Christians do not vote in primaries, Tim. And I want to talk there first, because we really have to talk about both realms before we get to the general, because in the primaries where we decide our conscience, you know, depending on the political party that we decide is more aligned with our biblical values, we make the choices on who we want as our candidates. And the general election is a whole nother discussion. So can you talk about primary processes for a second and why it's critical for Christians to start voting in those processes so they're not the ones just completely complaining in November. I'd be very pleased to. Uh, I remember uh, as if it were three seconds ago, uh, one of the most important conversations I ever had here in Washington uh, with the late Chuck Colson, I should say the late great Chuck Colson. He said to me two things in a matter of 90 seconds. He said, "Uh, Tim, salvation does not arrive on Air Force One. Uh, meaning that politics is not going to save us. I've never forgotten that. I think it's very clever, but it's true. And the second thing uh, that Chuck uh, said that I think was really rooted in fundamental wisdom uh, is that is that the first duty of Christian citizenship is to vote. Uh, And I've never forgotten either one of those maxims, the latter because it's theologically indisputable. Uh, You know, we are made for heaven and we are citizens of a place that we are going. Uh, There is no doubt that as much as we love the United States of America, we love our country, want to love and serve this beloved country, uh, that we're not here forever. We're in heaven forever. But as Chuck said, we have duties and obligations while we're here. So why on earth do biblical Christians in substantial numbers decide uh, that somehow that even though voting is the first duty of Christian citizenship, they don't exercise it? That, to me, is very puzzling. 
and I think in part, Bunny, and I think this is a bit surprising, is that there is a particular percentage, I think, of our fellow Christians, and I say this as a good thing, not as a criticism, but they're not made for politics. When they wake up in the morning, they're thinking about uh, their Lord and Savior. They are thinking about their spouse. They are thinking about their children. Uh, many American families are thinking about one, two, and three jobs that they have to uh you know, complete to, you know, to pay the bills. They're trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, really protect their children and grandchildren uh, from uh, the, the effects of the toxic culture. Oh, and by the way, then I get to think about politics, you know, and I think for a lot of us, that that, that is the, the, the way that we reason the world, you know, God first, family second, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, we can do it all in this regard that we can uh, think wisely, think smartly about the public square. And we have to exercise uh, that constitutional obligation. And here's why, very quickly. Bunny, my sense is the following. We are living in very perilous times. And if we lose the Constitution, we will never get it back. So it's important, I think, uh, that we exercise our citizenship and in very large, maybe historic numbers, get out and vote. And we have to remember, there is no more election day. How we wish it were. We all remember the Hallmark calendars uh, that say that's Christmas Day, that's Easter Day, that's Thanksgiving Day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there used to be that uh, little you know, uh, phrase that said election day. Well, that's over and done with. You can put it in a shoebox, take it to the Smithsonian. Whether we want it to be that way or not, it's not. Uh, and early voting, especially uh, in those seven battleground states is already well underway and Christians have to get out and be a part of it. Yeah, it's it's like uh, election month now or more, six that's weeks it. of yes. elections. And and so that's why what we do here at Christians Engage, guys, is so critical because we actually send you voting reminders when your ballot's available, when you can go early vote, where early voting's ending or when your ballot's due, if you have a mail-in ballot state, uh, and then three days before the election and on election day, because it really is a whole election season. So let's talk about this, Tim. This is really critical for people to understand how critical this election is. Yeah. Um, it's extremely critical. And uh, you addressed our young people in July. They said you were their favorite speaker, by the way. That's very kind. Yeah, yeah above me. So <laughs> we'll we'll bless them. Even you beat Senator <laughs> Cruz. So that was great. Um, but. You is because you broke down the importance of this election in such a clear way. As Christians, we have to look at the presidential election, but we also have to look at congressional elections and down ballot, our state representatives, our county officials. So yes. break this down. How should we think? How should we then live, brother, as it relates yes. to November 5th? You know, I did an interview very recently, and uh, somebody I like very much asked me, uh, in that interview, what is the difference between a statesman or stateswoman and a politician? And I said, is that is that a joke? Uh, uh, you know, you think it's a set up to a punchline. But the fact is, and this is my sense of it, we have wonderful people in the political process. We really do. Uh, but the political class is the political class. And so I said in that interview something that I think uh, worth repeating, which is that politicians very often think about the next election, but statesmen and stateswomen are thinking about the next generation. And I think that to be truly engaged as Christians, that to get out and vote, we have to think less about why are we here just for the next two year cycle, you know, in elections. And we have to think about the long term. We have to think about the next generation. And I want to be very blunt in this uh, point, if I may, uh, because we conservatives versus progressives we have to understand that whoever wants this rising generation of young Americans is going to get them. And progressives have a plan. They have a whole farm team up to the major leagues. They are very, very deliberate of wanting uh, this young generation. And we have to be just as serious minded about it. The other thing, uh, if I may say, is this ongoing debate that, you know, uh, I need to know more about the presidential candidate. I need to know more about the vice presidential candidate. That's all well and good, and I want to share something about that, if I may. But what I, I think is important, Bunny, is to remember is that every time that people are casting a ballot uh, for a president and a vice president, 
They are also voting for more than 3,000 political appointees and tens of thousands of bureaucrats across all of the cabinet agencies. You know, when you vote for candidate X or candidate Y, it's not just the 3,000 people who will come with them to office. It is the tens of thousands of people who are working in either the permanent or the semi-permanent bureaucracy. And very importantly, I think this is the most important thing to say in this regard, that every president of the United States, by the light of the Constitution, has the opportunity to nominate and confirm lifetime justices to the Supreme Court, lifetime judges to the appellate and circuit courts, and lifetime uh, positions to the district federal courts. And, you know, I'm taking one example, uh, President uh, Biden has been in office four years. By the time he's gone, he will have appointed one uh, Supreme Court justice, one of nine, uh, and he will have appointed, Bunny, over 200 federal judges. They, you know, uh, you know <laughs> someone once said, elections have consequences. Well, you know what? That's not a cliche. Elections have consequences, and it comes right down to every single Christian who needs to vote. You're voting for a president, a vice president, you're voting for 3,000 political appointees, tens of thousands of people in the bureaucracies, and lifetime appointments for judges and justices. Those are enormously big stakes. And probably at least two, if not three, Supreme Court justices could come up in the next four years, right, Tim? I mean, that's, Absolutely. And, yeah. and uh, you know, whether they believe in court packing, that that is a critical issue, too. You know, should we pack the court mm. or should we keep the court as it is? So we've got, yeah. a, we've got a lot of issues that go deep on this. Now, mm. now we've got control of the Senate. Uh, the House of Representatives, our state legislators, even, you know, our county sheriff or county commissioners. Yes. You know, so talk for a second about the importance of Christians voting mm. all the way down the ballot. And, right. And guys, we this is what we do at Christians Engage. We give you a five step guide to print off your ballot, research it. And let me tell you, spend 30 or 40 minutes doing that. Please turn off the TV for just a few minutes. And get it done um, and go in uh, educated. And we give you all the tools to do that at ChristiansEngage.org on our state pages and through our emails and texts. Text. So, um, Tim, talk about that, down ballots. I'd be honored to. And let me just say, down ballot, uh, this is not an overstatement, in the history of the pro-life movement, I mean, since 1973, when Roe against Wade was imposed upon our country, there has never been, never is a very dangerous word, there is never, it's like the word always, there has never been a more important November for the pro-life movement than this November. This November, in 10 states, we will have ballot initiatives uh, about whether to codify permanently, concretize into, glue into state constitutions, the, the mini version of Roe against Wade which is to say, uh, you know, abortion, uh, you know, any time from the first to the ninth month. I mean, these are enormous stakes. And I would say, Bunny, dollars to donuts, that the overwhelming majority of biblical Christians are probably unaware uh, that there are 10, not one, but 10 ballot initiatives down ballot across 10 key states. By the way, I was in a debate two weeks ago and one of my interlocutors said, well, yeah, they're they're you know, they're purple or blue states uh, with regard to, uh, you know, the ballot issues. I said just the opposite. Uh, I said we're looking at states this time like Florida, like Arizona and so many others. So it is not true uh, if people hear that it's a blue or purple, you know, sort of, uh, you know, fait accompli. That is not the case. It very much rides on one one, one individual votes. That's why every vote matters. Second thing, if I may go to your second point. Keep going. With regard, yes, with regard to the Supreme Court, uh, I, I want to, if I may, come to brass tacks, because this October, Clarence Thomas, who I think is the greatest American, but certainly uh, the, the most important constitutional jurist on the present Supreme Court, he will be on the court 30 three years this month. 
Uh, he is 75 years old. Uh, Justice Alito, Samuel Alito, another leading constitutionalist, uh, soon turned 73 years old. You know, we want uh, these great Americans, God willing, to live to be a thousand years old. Uh, but, you know, uh, in, in, in the life of nations and the lives of individuals, this underscores how important it is, because the next president will likely, as you say, likely uh, across the next four years, nominate and see confirmed at least one, maybe two, who knows, maybe more than that, Supreme Court justices. Let, you know, let, let's remember this. Donald Trump uh, was in, in, in office for four years. Across four years, more than 200 federal judges and three Supreme Court justices. That is actually breathtaking. Uh, I, I feel confident, Bunny, 100 years from now, uh, when the next people are doing interviews and conversations like this, they will definitively, definitively, historically look back uh, to, the, to the Trump presidency, and they will say on the domestic front, with no equal or peer, it was the fundamental reshaping of the federal uh, judiciary, not to mention the Supreme Court. Uh, so, yeah, so, so much is writing down ballot uh, uh, this November as well as up ballot. So it's important that people, uh, that, that, that Christians become engaged uh, and, that they, and that they step out, stand up, and encourage everybody in their uh, concentric circle of influence to get out and vote. It, exactly, Tim. And when you make it so clear, it's really not that hard to make these decisions. Like we all are wringing our hands going, oh, this is so hard. You know, we don't like some of the characteristics of all these candidates. But I mean, when it comes down to its values, platforms, principles, the things that we care about. And and guys, this is a critical what he just said about the ballot initiatives, because this is causing havoc in states like Florida and Arizona and other places. So you need to be paying attention to it. And if you're in one of those states, get out there and get your friends uh, to the polls. Um, so. Uh, I want to talk about your book, Tim, but before Great. we do that, just give us a day in the life of what you work on with Focus on the Family, because I think people would be very interested uh, to know what a day in the life of, of Tim Gagline looks like. Sure. That's very nice of you to ask. Every single day is different. Uh, you know, uh, Focus on the Family is partisan to the issues and not to the party. So we talk to everybody uh, in a typical week when Congress is in session. We are in touch with progressives and Democrats. We are in touch with Republicans and conservatives. We truly reach out to everybody. Uh, and we are motivated ultimately by a public policy and cultural matrix of ideas. Uh, we believe very strongly in the Washington office to focus on the family, that it's about relationships, reaching out and working uh, to advance family, marriage, parenting, uh, human life, religious liberty, conscience rights, and parental rights. We are eager to speak to the most liberal progressive, and we are eager to speak to the most conservative Republican about those issues. We pay attention to what happens in the Supreme Court and in all the federal courts. We engage with the think tank and public policy community. We engage with the media. Uh, I, I, I really could go on and on. It is ultimately about relationships, because in Washington, D.C., uh, even in our high tech era, it's really ultimately at a very organic level, Bunny, uh, about reaching out one on one, uh, you know, to people and, and seeking out, frankly, commonality where we can work together. You know, at Focus on the Family, Jesus Christ is the center of the ministry. And so sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with fellow believers and with people who are not believers or people who are seeking. Uh, we are interested, and we do this often, connecting with people who we will never discuss. Discretion is important, who are having challenges in their marriages, who are having challenges with their children and grandchildren, who are struggling at a very, very human level um, uh, with, uh, with, with the biggest issues of life. Um, and uh, through friendship, and comradeship, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, I, I'm honored to be able to do ministry in that regard at Focus on the Family because it's really ultimately about that. 
uh, focus on the family understands that Washington, D.C. is the most powerful city in the world. Uh, and it's important to have a place here and to engage left to right uh, with, uh, with as many people as we can on the issues that we care about. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that we believe uh, that, uh, that, that, that engaging ultimately uh, is a way uh, to share and to build the kind of confidences that allow you to see advances in the kind of cultural and public policy issues that you want to see. That's so good, Tim. And, you know, we have at Family Policy Alliance, we have uh, uh, Dylan Jeremiah there on the Hill, too. So hand, Indeed. In, hand in hand, you guys are taking the Hill for Terrific. Jesus. And it's, yeah. it's awesome. Um, OK, so you got a new book. Stumbling toward utopia. I want to get into this because, yeah, the progressive left looks like they're taking over our country. And you're detailing out how the 1960s really turned into a national nightmare and how how do we revive the American dream so many years later? I don't think we they could have imagined where we would be today, Tim, um, when you're talking about, you know, that 60 years ago. Here we are today talking about what is a woman and gender modification surgeries. I mean, it's coming so far from Woodstock. So uh, tell us a little bit about your book as we get close this down. You know, I don't think Saul Alinsky could have hoped uh, more than hope uh, that there would one day, in his uh, view of the world, be a moment where a Supreme Court nominee would come before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, with her husband, who is a medical doctor, sitting behind her. Uh, a very distinguished uh, a jurist, uh, and asked by a U.S. senator, what is a woman? And by the way, that U.S. senator has made very clear that she let Justice, now Justice Jackson, know that she was going to be asked that question. Uh, and even though she knew she was going to be asked a, a very basic biological question, uh, Justice Jackson made it very clear that it was impossible for her to answer. Uh, we all know that Justice Jackson knows the answer to that. The larger cultural question is where did that come from? Uh, why was there that need not to be truthful? Uh, and, uh, and the reality, uh, and this is what I deal with in Stumbling Toward Utopia, is to deal with the question of what was the impact of the moral and social revolution of the 1960s on our own time? I travel often for Focus on the Family Bunny, and every gathering I go to, left, right, or center, ideological, ideologically, people say, uh, I, I, I'm so concerned about my country. Uh, if they have children or grandchildren, they say, I'm particularly concerned about the future of the country. And then they will say, I don't know what to do. Where did this mess that we're in come from? And my answer to them is in the book. Uh, Stumbling Toward Utopia says, where did the radical ideas of the 60s actually come from? And I'm very clear to synthesize where they came from in our law, uh, in uh, the sexual revolution, in education, I go right through it in a way that is very crisp and very uh, easy to understand. And then I tie it directly uh, to how people can not just understand this, but what they can do about it. How can they respond effectively to the revolutionary radical ideas of progressivism? And I am an inveterate optimist. I'm a hopefulist. And I conclude the book by saying what I believe, which is that the American dream is not dead. We should not be discouraged. We should not be despairing because it negates a uh, hope. And in the life of a Christian, hope is the center. Uh, and, you know, and to be despairing and discouraging uh, is a sin. Uh, you know, so it seems to me, and I believe this very strongly, that if we are to revive the American dream, in the American experience for the next generation of Americans, we have to know how we got into this mess and we have to know what with specifics we can do about it. And in Stumbling Toward Utopia, that's what I attempt to do. Well, and as a new author this year, I've learned how important it is to get those books in people's hands when they first come out. So everybody go online, go to Amazon, wherever you get your books and get Tim Gagline's book. Uh, stumbling toward utopia and also his last one toward a more perfect union too. Tim's writing is just so clear and um, we're just so thankful to have you in our life and on our board of directors for Family Policy Alliance and Christians Engaged. It's just a blessing 
uh, Tim, to walk with you. So as we're closing out here, can we pray right now for the general election and for every Christian that is listening to this recording? And also, y'all share it with your friends. I want everybody to go to ChristiansEngage.org, take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage so you get all of the information you need. Share our voting resources. We have pages for all 50 states on our website. Share those with your family and friends. Our platform comparison between the two parties, our five-step guide. We've got everything there, all your polling places, everything at ChristiansEngage.org for you to do your civic duty. So, Tim, close us in prayer as we pray for our Christians to do what God's called them to do in this very important season. I'd be honored to do that. Lord, we just bring our beloved nation to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would come into the deepest details of our country. Uh, This is a perilous time, Lord, and we are very concerned, not only about the time in which we live, but uh, about the years to come. Yet we know that you have reassured us that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we ask, Lord, that you would come to all the families of the United States and especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that you would help give them wisdom and leading and guidance, and that people would see the importance of voting and that they would be motivated and that they would vote their values, that they would think anew about faith, freedom, family, the preciousness of our Constitution, uh, and all that we want for our country. We make a distinction, Lord, between uh, God and country. Uh, and, And those distinctions, Lord, are so important. You have taught us that. We love our country, but we love you first. And we ask, Lord, that as we approach Election Day, that you would bless the United States of America and that you would show us the way forward. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. 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 Well, I know that the Lord is going to use the body of Christ in this moment. My hope is in his people, Tim, and I know that your hope is in there too. We are the salt and light. We're the feet in the hands of the Lord in this moment. So I don't want to hear anybody say God is in control if you're not going to the polls, okay? Go to the polls, then we'll talk about God is in control after the election. But ultimately, he has limited his sovereignty to us doing our part in this moment. So I want you to get out there and do your part. And we're here at Christians Engaged to help you. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. And everybody go get Tim Gagline's Stumbling Toward Utopia book. Uh, Check it out wherever you get your books and uh, go vote and share this video with your family and friends. We love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredible podcast. What in the time we've had. We love you so much. We love being in your life. Have you subscribed? Have you shared this with your family and friends? Please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, wherever you get your audio or video pods. We need your help. This mission is undergirded by individuals just like you that support this ministry monthly, annually and whenever you think about us to be able to reach over a million Christians in the next two years. That's our goal. We want to empower a million Christians around America to pray, vote, and engage regularly. Will you help us? We're here to do that and we need your help. I want to say thank you to our partners at The Stream. What an incredible online publication put out by James Robinson and Life Outreach International as we come together across denominational lines as believers to discern what God's saying about the news of the day and to hear from different viewpoints. Check out the stream, make it your homepage, and get on their email list. This product is amazing. Also, our partners at Edify app, put out by Christian Post. This podcast app is a convergence of Bible teachers around America. We're excited to be a part of Edify app check out all their other podcasts. Thank you so much again for caring about this nation. We're here to help you pray, vote, and engage. We'll see you next week.